Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. In this first video, I want to talk about a very important topic, and that's, that's about cravings, about food cravings. You know, I've heard many people say that they feel they know what they could do to lose weight or regain their health, but somewhere along the way, they feel overpowered by these drives to have more food than they would plan to, or different foods than they would plan to. And oftentimes, they end up blaming themselves and thinking that it's you know, their fault, that it's a matter of weak will, that uh, it's a lack of discipline, but it's not. You know, it's really a chemical type reaction. And I want to make sense out of how these things happen and how they can not block your efforts towards getting back to your ideal health and your ideal weight. So for starters, how do you know if you have cravings? You know, how do you know if this is relevant to you or not? Well, it happens when you've planned a certain thing. You've planned to have, you know, here's the meal and here's the plate set. And somewhere along the way, your goalposts of what you want to have start to slide. They start to change. You, midway through a meal, you're like, wow, that was, I've probably had enough. I may not even be hungry, but that was really good. I just want to have some more. <laughs> and and it seems it seems so internal and so conscious. It feels inside of our brains as if it's a conscious decision we're making. And going into the meal, we wanted to have this much food, but along the way, we feel like we consciously change what we want. And that's not really what's happening. The other scenario is that we've planned out our day. We've planned out, you know, here's lunch, here's dinner, and somewhere midway through or afterwards, we also feel like we're consciously choosing to change our plans. And we're thinking, well, I did this and I followed that, but I know that there's this thing in the pantry that's calling my name. <laughs> and this can be so powerful and it can feel so compelling. So what does a healthy appetite feel like? So if that's kind of what cravings are, how does it feel when things work well? You know, a healthy appetite, it's pretty cool. I've really spent a lot of time in both of those worlds, and I can talk about a distinction. A healthy appetite is being hungry, and being hungry for foods that you choose to fuel your body. So when you've got a healthy appetite, there's a point at where you realize you've, you've done some things, you've gone through the day, and it's time to eat. You're really wanting some food, and you can consciously choose you know, how you're going to feel. And you can imagine in your mind certain meals, certain options, and how your function will be afterwards. You know, what your energy will be like, how your metabolism is going to feel, and how your tastes and cravings might change from that. And you can really just have a feel for that, and you follow it, and it becomes a very conscious, deliberate choice. And there's a point at where you've had some good food, that, that you've chosen some healthy food, and you're satisfied, and you're all good, and now it's time to go do something else. <laughs> so when things work well, that's, that's how it feels. And that's so liberating. It's so cool to be able to just consciously choose what and when and how much, and, and be finished, and then move along, and to be outside of the chains of cravings. It can be so powerful. So I want to talk to you guys about a really simple system that will help you defeat this and help you have a healthy, controlled appetite. And there's really only three steps to that. And one of the steps is automatic, so I guess there's only two effort steps. <laughs> the first one is to add fiber, and the second one is to drop fructose. And the result of that, the third step, is to gain freedom. And that's what you get. So freedom is cool because you're able to eat by choice, by conscious intent. You know, I think about our brains as we often imagine like this little tiny thing behind our eyes that has a set of controls, like it's driving a big truck or something, and like there's our conscious mind behind there. I think about it more like two parts. You know, there's one set of controls that Mr. Spock has, and there's one set of controls that Homer Simpson has. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got these different parts of our, of our mind, of our consciousness. And how we structure and set up our day and our fiber and our fructose determines who's in charge of the steering wheel. <laughs> do you want rational, logical choices to fuel your body and become healthier? Or do you want Homer Simpson crashing into a tree stopping for a donut? <laughs> That's totally what happens. <laughs> so I'll teach you guys a really easy system. And the cool thing is that 
and really empowers you. You can, you can choose to create your health as you see fit. You do not have to be a victim to what foods are around or what someone else has or what things you may have liked in the past. You can consciously create your own health and your own physiology as you choose and as you deem best. And the cool thing about that is not only is that great by itself, but there's so much guilt and shame and blame that we often feel when Homer's at the wheel. <laughs> we often feel that it's some personal lack or some moral deficit that's holding us back. And that becomes this spiral of self-defeating beliefs and self-defeating behaviors. So when you can step away from that and liberate that energy towards your health and your positive efforts and the things you really want to do in your life and the connections with your loved ones, it's, it's so incredible. So here's a little bit about how this, how this applies to me um, and why I've experienced this in both ways. As a kid, I was epileptic and I gained a huge amount of weight because I really didn't have coordination. You know, I could not do physical activities. And I realized, I've got this vivid memory of being about seven years old and my parents were, were small owners in a resort. We lived there and worked it. And I had some unsupervised time around this like professional kitchen and like a lot of food. <laughs> and I would, I, I remember myself sneaking out this handful of chocolate chip cookies and walking around in the grounds and eating these things. Things. And, you know, I was probably probably bored. I was probably um, just wanting some attention or wanting something. And I found out that this would give me some endorphin rush. It would make me feel almost like high or euphoric to have all these extra cookies. And I had this vivid memory of that realization. And for the next, boy, many, many years, I spent battling these drives towards foods. And I, I gained huge amounts of weight from that. And it took a lot of thought and a lot of effort to change that. But I really lived out of control for quite some time during that first stretch of years. And I've had several other times in my life to where if I've not really followed the fiber fructose ratios or I've not been in a good space, that they've come back and they've really just been overpowering and almost overwhelming. So I've, I've lived through this, I felt it, and I've gone through the other side of it. And I was able to make a difference and see this change occur in myself the same way that you can as well. So, and that was, that was me, but I've seen others go through the same thing as well. You know, there was a, a woman that I spoke to about two months ago, and she, her, her main concern was, was really anxiety, you know, anxiety and insomnia, and then her weight being a struggle. And the more we talked, the more we realized that she was really addicted to sugar. You know, she was constantly, compulsively consuming high amounts of this. And, you know, high amounts, not even like crazy quantities, but just, I guess, frequency would be a more accurate way to put that. You know, often throughout the day, she would need a little bite of this or a little bit of that. And her levels of stress and anxiety were so high, and then she could not properly sleep at night. And she was also driven towards more caffeine to kind of raise her energy levels. And I saw this as a vicious cycle. You know, the, the expectation that she had was, what's a natural thing I can take to lower my anxiety? And as we got into this discussion, I realized, you know, it's not a lack of a supplement. It's really this nature with food and this relationship with food and how can we shift that? So we saw over the course of just two weeks, you know, I saw her after she went through the same process. And she said that for the first time in decades that she was free from anxiety. I mean, there's normal stressors that come up, but just haunting background ongoing stressors and, and, and random thoughts were not there for her. And she did mention that the first few days were difficult, but after that, it was really not. So we've seen these things so many times, and I'm really excited for you to have the same experience. So easy thing, um, we want to add fiber, we want to lose fructose. So the relevance about fiber is that it slows how quickly our food gets into our bloodstream. So we want to have this steady delivery of fuel coming into our bodies, like a real gentle touch on the gas pedal. We don't want to have a big surge, like a puddle of gas that you drop a match on. We do not want that. When we get a big surge of fuel, we have 
we do not have healthy energy, we have just stimulation and then it drops. Fiber is something that delays how fast food comes into our system. When we swallow a meal, it mixes with liquid in our stomach. And after that, it goes into our small intestine. From there, it goes across the little villi directly into our bloodstream. And that's when we're really assimilating it and making use out of it. Now, fiber makes all that happen more slowly. So there's a more gradual entry of food into the bloodstream. And all throughout the day, the more fiber we have with our meals, the more stable and steady our blood sugar levels are. Now the tie-in is that cravings, <clears throat> they, are, they are not psychological shortcomings. Cravings do not come about because of what your parents did or did not do or things like that. Cravings come about because your blood sugar levels have abruptly changed. You know, they were steady and they started to come down quickly. And your brain says, I need fuel. You know, I need fuel now. And that makes it to where you are a puppet on strings. And it feels like you've suddenly chosen to change your plans. You've so you suddenly said, huh, you know, a cookie would really be nice about this time of the afternoon. And it seems like it's a conscious decision, but it's not, it's just a chemical reaction. Now, our first meal has the biggest impact throughout the whole day of how stable our blood sugar is. And one of the biggest variables that makes that first meal work better is the fiber content. And fiber we get from a variety of foods, and there's a couple different types of it. If you get good amounts and good variety, you will have good blood sugar, good state of blood sugar, and you will have fewer cravings and better energy. So your first meal, it's good to include a mixture of soluble and also insoluble fibers. The soluble fibers, the best version of those would be from uh, fruits and also vegetables. We get good amounts from both of those. My favorite dense source of that would be blackberries. They're actually one of the highest fruit sources. We're going to talk more about fructose as well. They're also superstars because they have very minimal amounts of fructose. So blackberries, powerful things to include in the morning. Even a, even a quarter cup is adequate to make a big difference. The other big helpful version of fiber is the insoluble fiber. Now a great source of those is chia seeds. Chia seeds are rich in some quality proteins, you know, the great insoluble fiber, also many good minerals and some good plant-based calcium. So you get those two together with your first meal and that's going to make the day's blood sugar much more steady. Now an easy way to get those is with a shake. And that's a great time for protein. You can also drop some greens in that as well. And that will raise the soluble fiber intake even further. As the day goes on, each of your meals, you want to have some healthy version of carbohydrate. And the better versions of carbohydrate, they will naturally contain that fiber. You do also want some good fats. You want small amounts with each of the meals. And Fats, the best ones we're going to get from fish and seafood. The other good source is raw nuts and seeds. And that latter group will also be high in many of the good fibers. As far as the best versions of starch to include healthy carbs, that would be beans and legumes and intact whole grains and also vegetable starches, especially those with the skins on them still. So beans and legumes, the white ones are the most powerful. So navy, northern, and cannellini. They they have the soluble fiber, the insoluble, and also a thing called resistant fiber, which is very powerful. Uh, grains, intact whole grains, I make a distinction between whole grains and even the flour. So even like brown rice, the flour acts differently than whole grain brown rice does. You know, it absorbs so much faster and acts so much differently in the body. So intact whole grains that have been steamed but not, not chopped up and not made into flour are very different. Then we've got the good vegetable carbs. These are awesome foods. Uh, squashes, you know, acorn squash, kabocha squash, spaghetti squash, really wonderful. Turnips, parsnips, rutabagas. Grandpa always loved those. <laughs> Sweet potatoes, uh, yams, regular potatoes. Potatoes are really good foods. They've gotten a bad rap about the nightshade solanaceae thing. You know, if you take green potatoes that are sprouting and you take the green part and you concentrate that, 
that's bad, that's icky, <laughs> but you don't eat them in that stage. That's where the toxins are. Apart from that, they don't have that. We thought for a while that tomatoes were poisonous too because they're in that same family. We now know they are not, and nor are potatoes. So those are all great options for healthy carbs. So that's the fiber. So each of your meals, you wanna add in nice amounts of fiber, especially your first. The other part is fructose. So Fiber being good, fructose we want to limit, we want to minimize. And fructose is something that we get from a lot of processed foods. You know, we hear about high fructose corn syrup. It's also sugar. So sugar itself, table sugar, is equal parts of glucose and fructose. Fructose is unique in that our liver has to do extra work to process it. And when our liver works harder, that makes our blood sugar drop off at some point. When our blood sugar drops off, we crave cookies or, <laughs> or even raisins or even just seconds, even just more food than we planned on having. So it's all about keeping the blood sugar steady. And fructose has become our enemy for that. <clears throat> it's a tough thing. Fruits themselves are not bad foods at all, but we've reached a state because of the toxins in the environment acting on our liver and because of the high amount of processed fructose to where we're less tolerant of good fructose than we would have been in the past. So even fruits are good to really think about and really keep at a low level if you've got cravings. And that's true throughout the day. It's most true earlier in the day. So you really want to minimize and avoid the fruit with your first couple meals. I mentioned those blackberries at about a quarter cup. That can really get you through for most of the day as far as your fruit content. I would even avoid the apples, the pears, the cherries, even blueberries, uh, tropical fruits, you know, bananas, uh, papayas, mangoes, dried fruits, fruit juices. And of course, to talk about this, we're, also, we're already assuming that the sodas, the candies, the cakes, the cookies, that those are just not even on the discussion. Those are foods that they perpetuate the cravings. You know, the less of these things they have, we have the less that we want. And on the outside, it seems so counterintuitive. We feel driven to have them and that we feel it seems as if they're going to satisfy us, but they really do not. They really end up making us want more. So we want to really stay away from the fructose and then the unhealthy starches, those that are made from flowers and those that come from processed foods. So the fructose being low, the fiber being high, that that yields freedom and that yields fewer cravings. There's been many papers showing that this also benefits our cholesterol levels, our triglycerides, our blood pressure, our immune system. There's so many ways that this fiber fructose ratio helps. Oh, if that's not enough, how about the skin? <laughs> that's an attention getter for, for a lot of us as we hit our 40s and our 50s is the health of our skin. There's these things called AGEs, AGE for age, right? So they're uh, advanced glycation end products and they're things that make our skin wrinkle and lose our collagen. We make them from fructose. <laughs> we make them from fructose more than anything. So the more fructose we eat, the more our skin ages prematurely. So if you don't want advanced glycosylated end products, AGE, you wanna keep the fructose low for healthier glowing skin. So the benefits about this when cravings are lower, you now have autonomy. You've got control over your health. And oftentimes, the struggle for health is as much of anything, just a struggle for control and a struggle for being back in charge of what's happening to your body. When you have that, you know, when you have that sense of control again, that spills over in so many other ways of your life. You know, your confidence goes up, you become naturally eager to do more things that will promote your health in other ways. So it becomes a good, virtuous spiral. Um, and these benefits can be quite tangible. By really going high in fiber and low in fructose, people can see two to four inches drop off in the first month if they're on a very structured regime doing this strategically. So it can happen so quickly. And it's really about the inches. It's really about the waste more than anything. And that can change promptly. These same changes in confidence and a sense of control, they spill over into relationships. You know, we can communicate better. We can feel more more secure about who we are, we can express our own needs more effectively. So all these side benefits are so real.
So I want to issue a challenge to you all. Uh, this next this next 30 days, uh, two, two things. Think about fructose and think about the fat clothes. <laughs> I've, I've had them. I've had the double wardrobe in the past. So ditch them both. You know, take a close look through your pantry and look for all sources of food that have more than about three grams of fructose per serving. Three grams per serving, time to go. Uh, donate them. There's so much need for food banks and at some point, you know, any food is better than none for those who are really at a point of lack. So take those things together and donate those. On the way home, stock up with lots of good intact whole grains, healthy low fructose fruits, nuts and seeds, uh, lots of veggies, some ones you've not tried before, and good lean proteins. The clothes that you keep around for the times when you're feeling heavier or thicker, donate those too. You don't really need, need those. Those will not serve you. Make your path more committed and make yourself more intentional and give yourself fewer outs and escapes. <laughs> It'll make it more effective for you by far. Uh, and also, the same thing, another great challenge, reach out to a friend. You know, connect with a friend or a loved one and just talk about this easy thing about this high fiber, low fructose, these steps that you're taking and share with him or her how to do that and get a buddy in place, have someone collaborate with you and help you become accountable and give yourselves feedback on how this all works out. So remember, we're adding fiber, we're losing fructose, and we're gaining freedom. So what could be cooler than that? So I'll be back with you really soon in this next video. I'm gonna talk about how there may be toxins lurking in your kitchen that are short-circuiting your weight loss efforts. And we're gonna identify those and eliminate those. So I always love the great feedback that I get. Please, please ask your questions in this content and we'll, be take, a, we'll take a close look at those and give you feedback on those very promptly as well. So take wonderful care of yourselves and thank you for participating and I look forward to seeing you really soon.